is up guys for this video I want to go over everything that I have done to this truck that allowed it to make 250 wheel horsepower on a dyno with this turbo setup so we are going to be going over every single modification under the truck just the stuff that has allowed it to make that amount of power and that is it I will be making a full detailed overview essentially on the entire build everything that I have done to it in a later video but that video is going to be really long and I wanted to have just this video on its own so that anybody who's looking to turbocharge their 3.9 liter V6 knows exactly where to go and they can get just the information they're looking for and not a bunch of extra stuff thrown in with it so first thing we will talk about before we even talk about the turbo kit is the fuel management system that I am running so in this truck I am running a Mega Squirt 2. This is a version 3.57 board. I think that is the currently still the latest version board that they make, but I'm not 100% sure on that. Um, but this ECU was originally built and used in a 420A Mitsubishi Eclipse. So a naturally aspirated second generation Eclipse is what that was originally built for. And it needed no modifications whatsoever. For me to be able to wire it up to the 3.9 liter v6 and run it it was literally take that ecu from you know what was originally in the 420a rewire it and it worked so if you want to know what mega squirt modifications need to be done in order to run a mega squirt 2 on a 3.9 liter v6 the only modification that it needs is the crank position sensor driver to be converted from the out of the box have a VR sensor driver, crank position sensor driver, and you have to have that swapped out for one that allows it to read a Hall effect sensor. So that's the only modification the Mega Squirt 2 needs um, from its state out of the box state, and that's it. You wire it up, and it runs the 3.9 liter perfectly, pretty much. It is compatible with every factory Magnum sensor except for one, and it is actually arguably the most uh, important sensor on the engine, and that is the crank position sensor. So I am not running the factory Magnum crank position sensor at all. It would normally be mounted back here uh, on the side of the transmission. You can kind of see a hole right there where it would be. I am not running it. What I am running is a Hall Effect distributor from a pre-Magnum 3.9 liter V6. The pre-Magnum 3.9s had a Hall Effect sensor in the distributor that functioned both as crank position and cam position readings. That sensor is directly compatible with the Mega Squirt 2. So all you have to do is get a pre-Magnum distributor. It drops right on. You do have to get the correct wires for it because it uses different style plug wires. Uh, get the right wires, get the cap and rotor, get the whole you know distributor. You can buy them brand new on Rock Auto pretty cheaply, or you can go to the junkyard and get one. Just beware, the hull sensor itself tends to fail on these. So if you get one in the junkyard, you may not have a functioning sensor. You may want to just replace it right away. They're very notorious for giving out. That is the only thing you have to swap out, and it is an OEM part that you replaced you know your original distributor with a new one with a hull effect sensor in it, and you are good to go. This distributor would have been found in 1991 and older throttle body injection 3.9 liter V6s. And I think this same distributor would have been found in the you know pre-Magnum 5.2 liter V8s as well. But I don't know if the tooth count and everything on the V8 distributor sensor would be the same or different. But this one, like I said, if you get one that's for 3.9 because that's what this is. You bolt it in, you wire it up, Megasquirt reads it, and boom, you have crank position, and you can do all of the turbo stuff you want. So factory coolant temp sensor, factory air temp sensor, throttle position sensor, all of those work. And then you also want to run a wideband oxygen sensor. So I am running an AEM wideband oxygen sensor, uh, which requires you to have the sensor and also the gauge, which is right there the wideband sensor gauge functions as essentially a translator so the signal from the oxygen sensor goes to the gauge first and then to the mega squirt so you have to have the whole kit you can't just have the wideband sensor at least with a mega squirt too uh, and you definitely want to have a quality wideband AFR gauge anyway because if you don't know what AFRs you're running you can't tune so that is another thing it's very important it kind of falls under the ECU slash engine management category here but 
you definitely want some sort of tunable ECU. Mega Squirt 2 is the cheapest. There may be others at work, but I don't have any experience with them, so I can't really say. Um, OBD2 ECUs from the factory can be flash tuned, I think, but I would suggest not bothering with them because they're very finicky and they are notorious for not being very reliable ECUs to begin with. They have a lot of internal ballast resistors that like to blow up and stuff. So if you want a turbocharger 3.9, go ahead and get yourself a Mega Squirt if you're on a budget or if you want to look into something more expensive like a Holly or an AEM or something like that, you can. But the budget method, the proven budget method is the Mega Squirt 2. Mega Squirt 3, of course, works as well, but that costs more money and you don't really need it to make this kind of power on one of these engines. So the Mega Squirt 2, of course, I had built by DIY Auto Tune, so they took an out-of-the-box Mega Squirt 2, essentially modified it to run, you know, a 420A, but those modifications also allowed it to run on the 3.9, and shipped it out to me with a wiring harness, which I had to wire up to the 3.9 liter Magnum harness, and boom, there we go, I had engine management. You also have to buy a Tuner Studio license in order to be able to tune stuff. And then you also want to get a Mega Log Viewer license as well, so you can actually read logs after you go and drive the thing. Um, the free versions have a decent amount of capabilities, but if you have a Mega Squirt in your vehicle, you really, really should spend, I think it's like 60 or 70 bucks for the Tuner Studio license, and I think it's about the same for the Mega Log Viewer. I think Mega Log Viewer is cheaper, but I can't remember how much. It's like $100 for the pair of them together. Definitely worth buying. You can have it on up to three or four computers at a time. So uh, definitely worth the investment if you're going to be running any sort of mega squirt in any of your vehicles. Also, if you run a full standalone and you remove the factory ECU from your truck completely, you will want to get a aftermarket voltage regulator. A lot of trucks will already have these because the voltage regulator is found in the ECU and they tend to fail in the ECU and then your alternator doesn't work. So a lot of trucks will already have one of these, but they're pretty simple, very cheap, very common. You can buy them online for like, I don't know, 30 or 40 bucks. This one I think I paid a little bit more because I wanted a really quality one, but once again, pretty cheap, very simple and easy to wire up, and that's it. And, or if you wanted to run like a GM alternator or something, you could, but I have no experience with swapping one of those onto here. I know it's been done, but I've never done it, so I can't speak too much on that anyway. With all of that out of the way, we can move on to the actual turbo kit itself. So I built this turbo kit using factory cast iron exhaust manifolds. This side has the passenger side bolted up to it. So you basically take your passenger manifold, move it over to the driver's side, driver's side over to the passenger side. They're flipped and still pointing down though as they would be if they were bolted to the other side. And then from those factory manifolds, I've got a homemade Y pipe which is made out of some mandrel bent tubing I bought on eBay, 2 inch, which has the you know original like Y pipe cups, which are bolted to the Y pipes, and then the mandrel bent tubing comes around from both sides up into this Y pipe, which I also purchased on eBay. And then from this Y pipe, it runs up into the turbocharger. This flange right here was like 20 or 30 bucks. It's a three inch inlet, so I had to get a two and a half inch to a three inch adapter. That's what all this is going on here but it's a pretty simple setup. You will have to ditch your clutch fan in order to make room for this as well as the entire fan shroud and I no longer have a factory radiator in here so I don't know for sure that all of this would clear behind a factory radiator. Um, it probably would because the factory radiator sits in about this area but say if you had electric fans behind it because you have to get rid of the clutch fan, I'm not sure what kind of space you would end up with here. And then off the Y pipe I have this pipe here which runs to the wastegate which is being recirculated into the dump pipe. Once again, all of this piping was purchased on eBay. It's all mandrel bent stuff. This is two and a half inch. This is more of the two inch stuff here. And then it's all full homemade exhaust all the way down. Once again, all mandrel bent pipes down under the truck. And it runs out the side of the bed over there. There's a two and a half inch glass pack muffler on it as well to keep it from being super loud and obnoxious because otherwise it drones a lot through the base of the bed. This whole exhaust setup probably cost in all the materials I would say $250 to $300. I would have to really go and add everything up but the piping kits were like I think it was uh, $80 for the two and a half inch piping kit and I had to just buy one to do the entire truck and then I had two of the two inch mandrel bent kits. Each of those was like $60 a piece and then you've got you know your downpipe flange and then the wastegate flanges 
turbo flange, it all kinds of adds up to about 250 or 300 bucks for everything, which is pretty good. And all of this was built using a Harbor Freight flux core welder. I haven't had any issues with welds cracking or anything like that. They've held up fine. These welders are finicky and a little bit difficult to use, but they work. They hold up fine as long as you don't have really dirty metal like I did here. That's why those look like crap, but they still work. They haven't cracked. They haven't fallen apart, and we will be... we're still good, so it's worked just fine. Moving on to the turbocharger itself, this is a Garrett T3, which would have come from the factory on a Ford Thunderbird Turbo Coupe. This would have been on the later ones. So this is the one with the larger turbine and compressor. Uh, the earlier ones, they weren't even Garrett turbos. I can't remember what kind of turbos it came with. But this has a 63 AR turbine and a 60 AR compressor. Now this is a very old design turbo. It's very inefficient. Uh, all the aerodynamics and the compressor wheel itself aren't the best. And the outlet on the turbo housing is only one and three quarter inches. This turbo was completely peaked out at 250 wheel horsepower. We tried turning the boost up, it would spike in the real low revs, and then it would just fall right back on its face, and it just wanted to sit at about 7 PSI and make about 250 wheel. It just would not make any more. We tried adding timing to it, pulling timing from it. Like I said, I've got a boost controller mounted right here. Tried turning it up with that. We would get harder spikes. They were would jump up to like 10, 11 pounds sometimes, but then it would just plummet right back once it actually started making some horsepower. So that was all this thing could do. And even with the turbo totally maxed out, we were still able to make 250 horsepower reliably all year long. So this thing has held up very well. Moving on from the turbo, we've got a random assortment of couplers and piping going on here for the intake. I don't even remember where some of this stuff came from. I know the coupler and the T-bolts came from the eBay intercooler kit that I bought. And then this filter was originally on my old PT Cruiser, actually. I had a turbo PT Cruiser that I bought this guy for because it doesn't have the devil cup chrome cap thingy on it that destroys turbos. So that's what that was from. It was just laying around. Same with this pipe. I think that used to be on my 420A Eclipse at one point. It was like painted red. I remember that and I had to grind it all off. One very important thing you're going to want is one of these aluminum carburetor intake hats. You have to get one of these. You cannot use the plastic intake hats off of the later generation Dakotas. I know this because I tried on my old Dakota and learned the hard way that they explode. I'll insert a picture of that right here. So you have to get one of these. They're very pricey for how simple of a part they are. They're like usually over a hundred bucks for one of these things, but you have to have one. There is no other option. Any plastic intake hat will explode. I've learned that the hard way. I inserted the picture so you guys can see proof of it. So I've got that and then underneath of the throttle, underneath of it on the throttle body, I made my own bracketry to actually securely clamp this intake hat down because the stock bracketry is just made to hold a little you know round filter intake up here it's not made to actually hold in pressurized air and it will flex and potentially bend under boost and leak a ton of air so I'll insert a picture of my bracketry on the throttle body right here all of that works out very well I've had no issues with any sort of boost leaks or anything coming from this setup this setup is going to remain on here for a while now continuing with the intake Underneath of this intake manifold is what's known as a belly pan. These belly pans have a gasket that is notorious for leaking even on naturally aspirated engines as the gasket deteriorates and dries up but eventually cracks and you end up with a giant vacuum leak coming from within the crankcase of the engine so you end up with the thing just running horribly and burning tons of oil. And if you already have a very old worn out gasket that's potentially already a little bit cracked, and you throw some boost at it, the thing's going to pretty much d blow up. I mean, that gasket is not made for that. So, first thing you want to do is put in a fresh gasket and make sure that all of the bolts on the belly pan are torqued to spec. That would probably be enough to hold up under low boost scenarios, because keep in mind this thing is also dealing with vacuum all the time and it holds up fine with, you know, X amount of vacuum, so the pressure, as long as you're not getting too carried away, will be fine as long as your gasket is 
healthy and new and like I said all the bolts are torqued to spec not over or under torqued and you want to get a quality gasket for it now one other extra thing that I did was I welded a brace in the at a shape of an X to the bottom of the belly pan I've heard of these belly pans exploding I don't know if people are just referring to the gasket or the pan itself but I figured stiffening up the pan would help reduce its movement and flexing which could help potentially extend the life of the gasket so I'm less likely to blow the gasket sealing it in the end also so I'll insert a picture of the modifications to the belly pan as well right here moving on to the actual piping in the intercooler itself most of this intercooler piping I bought in a kit on eBay for about hundred and twenty bucks this intercooler all the black piping and all the blue couplers came with it and then this silver coupler I had laying around from an old eBay turbo kit I bought a few years ago and then there's an exhaust pipe right there because I didn't have anything short enough and there's a couple of other random things I had to make my own adapter to go off of the end of this turbocharger into the elbow here because this turbocharger has a two bolt flange on the end of the outlet on the compressor and I didn't have the correct you know fitting to bolt up to that so I had to make my own out of ironically a 38 millimeter wastegate flange like that I welded a pipe to it that goes from you know the one and three quarter inch outlet on the turbo to a two inch and then it's a two inch to two and a half inch coupler bolted to that adapter that I made and it has worked just fine and efficient because it's a tiny outlet on a tiny turbo but it still works and I haven't had any issues with it leaking or doing anything like that and then for a blow off valve I'm running the very typical eBay HKS ripoff so this is an HKS SQV generic version it's not a real one obviously and then a pipe adapter that I bought on eBay as well the pipe adapter was kind of expensive it was like thirty dollars for that stupid thing almost as much as the valve I think the valve was forty pipe was 30 so those things aren't cheap even for ripoff versions of them but once again I haven't really had any issues with that I also haven't any, had any issues with the eBay wastegate some people report having problems but this one has done perfectly fine as has the eBay SQV I still get questions on the video that I made on that thing all the time people asking me if it held up and everything still here still works only issue I've had is that the pipe isn't made right so the snap ring doesn't pop all the way in so I basically just glued the thing in there with our TV and it doesn't leak any boost so we are all good to go next thing we should talk about is the oil lines for the turbo and we'll talk about coolant lines real quick first just because it's easy so the coolant lines in the turbo run from here where the outlet for the heater core is it actually runs into the heater core back out like it would factory and then from there the one heater hose runs underneath and into the turbo through this elbow here and then out of the turbo here through that 90 and then straight down to the uh, what would be the recirculation port for the heater core on the water pump um, worked very well like that I've had no issues other than it does make the heater much less effective because the turbo restricts the flow of antifreeze through it but if you're not concerned about restricting your heater core this works very very well and you do maintain somewhat of having heat it just doesn't don't plan on driving the thing in very cold weather because it's just gonna blow cold air at you but in the summertime your windows are getting steamy it's perfect for that and then for the oil lines on the back of the engine block there is a oil pressure sending unit that thing I've completely removed is no longer here so my stock oil pressure sending unit gauge just doesn't work and then in its place since it is a 1 8 inch NPT I was able to just install a 1 8 inch NPT male to male fitting with a T on top of it put those into the engine block and then I have the oil feed line in one of the ports and then I have a mechanical oil pressure gauge coming out of one of the other ones and then the final port is just blocked off so we are nearing the end of the video here I've covered just about everything so one final thing I want to talk about is the ignition coil I have upgraded to an MSD blaster 2 coil I don't know that upgrading your ignition coil is 100% necessary, but it is more difficult for a stock ignition coil to fire your spark plugs well under you know higher cylinder pressure. So having a little bit of extra power added to your ignition system is important. Other than that, I am running one MSD wire from the coil to the distributor. The rest of it is all OEM stuff. And then for spark plugs, I am running a spark plug that is one step colder than the factory plugs and the part number for this plug is ZFR6F11 it is an NGK spark plug 
very good plugs. I've had the same ones in here for over two years now and they're just finally starting to get a little bit upset and that's with a lot of abuse and lots of E85 has been fired by those things. So they've held up pretty well. Definitely worth the money. They're definitely not cheap. They're over $10 a piece, but good quality spark plugs and uh, you're definitely going to need to go at least one step colder on a boosted setup and they are the most common plugs that you see people with supercharged 5.2s and 5.9s running which is essentially the same thing as this engine just they have two more cylinders and that pretty much covers the whole setup so a couple of other things I do want to cover really quickly I already mentioned the fact that you have to remove your clutch fan and the fan shroud and stuff to make room for all of the piping up here if you want your turbo located in this spot another thing that you will no longer be able to have is your power steering pump because the outlet of this manifold will run straight into it so if you want to mimic my setup you will no longer be able to have a clutch fan or power steering so please keep that in mind other than that a lot of the stuff on this truck functions correctly I still have a windshield washer and functioning wipers the truck drives on the street fine all of my factory stuff pretty much works I obviously don't have cruise control or anything like that but the thing behaves very very well on the street this is about as good as you're gonna get if you went a relatively streetable turbocharged 3.9 V6 Dakota that makes 250 wheel horsepower so I hope you guys have found this helpful I hope that all of this information has encouraged a lot of you guys who've been on the fence about turbocharging your 3.9 to just go out and do it if you have a project 3.9 Dakota you're looking to have some fun with it and maybe you're just looking to do it and blow the 3.9 up just as an excuse to put a V8 in it, whatever it may be. Or you want to pursue the 3.9 a little bit further and uh, just see how much you can get out of it, kind of like I am right now. Uh, I hope that those of you who are looking to build one of these, for whatever reason it may be, have found this information helpful. Now, if you have any more questions on anything about the setup on this truck, leave it in the comments below and I will respond to your questions there. Or, if you want to be able to contact me directly, I will have links to my Instagram and my TikTok account in the description as well. So you guys can find me there, DM me, and I will do my best to help you guys there. With all that said, that is going to be the end of this video. Like I said, hope you guys have enjoyed. Hope many of you have found it helpful. And I will be back very soon to give you guys a full look at the entire truck. Every modification I have done to it, I'm just going to go down a list and let you guys know everything so if you want to know the full build specs that will be coming up soon but for now that's going to be all thank you guys very much for watching i will see you all later